besides serving as our president for the last year and for the coming year, I'd like to remind you all that the most prestigious award that this society gives, the gold medal, which has been given since 1824, was given to John in geophysics in 2014. He's very illustrious, and we look forward to a, a talk today on the most amazing and unique moon so far, even an exoplanet of sorts, an exomoon, something about Titan. <laughs> Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, Don did extensive research on me, told me just before this meeting. He looked me up on Wikipedia, which apparently <laughs> says that I became a fellow of the Society in 2016. <laughs> so I, I used to believe Wikipedia. I use it for <laughs> most of my talks, but it's occasionally wrong. So um, I, I was counting on 45 minutes. I have 40 minutes, so I got 45 slides. Uh, it'll be a little bit of a, a whistle-stop tour. And uh, also, I, I'm using a bit of uh, poetic and artistic license uh, uh, along the way. So I should start with the title, which I have to admit I actually stole from a presentation I heard, but in another continent even. So uh, hopefully, uh, you know, one can steal a title if it's from a long way away. And... Uh, <laughs> And, and there is, uh, let's say, artistic license in the title. Um, I, I'm not going to pretend that uh, we should reclassify Titan in any way, or that Titan even thinks, you know. Um, but uh, the, the purpose, I hope, is clear. I mean, I think we tend to think of, of planets as fairly um, complex and uh, even subtle objects, and moons, on the whole, are smaller being more bland and, and of less interest. But I think that uh, in, in many respects, in recent years, with discoveries around several objects, Titan, Enceladus, Ganymede, and so on, we see that uh, there is great, uh, even complexity, interest. Uh, and, and, and for that reason, that's why I use this, this title. And, also, it's, it's particularly apposite to be talking about this object now, because this is an image from just, uh, I think, 20 days ago. This is the last image taken by Cassini uh, on the 22nd of April on its very last close flyby of Titan. Uh, so this was a close flyby at, a at about 1,000 kilometers but this is, this is a distant image as, as Cassini was receding, so one, one of the last relatively close views uh, that we will have had from, from Cassini. This was the 127th close flyby uh, of Titan. I'm now going to spend a few minutes talking about the, the history of, of Titan, or at least the history of our knowledge of it. So we go back to this uh, handsome young man, uh, Christian Huygens, uh, Wikipedia describes him as, <laughs> if I can remember, an astronomer, a physicist, a mathematician, a probabilist, because he, he, he worked on, on game theory, games theory, uh, and a horologist, as he was the inventor of the pendulum uh, clock. Uh, so really, a, a, a real polymath. And in his, his 20s, around this time, he uh, turned his telescope uh, to, to the Saturnian system and, uh, and, and discovered Titan, or at least was the first, I think, to recognize it as a, a moon of, of Saturn. And, and so he has that uh, as one of his many uh, claims to fame. He, he named the object uh, Luna Saturni, do have Latin O level, I think that means moon of Saturn. <laughs> um, and I actually should have known this, but I, I had to check up on it. Who was it who actually named, uh, who gave this, this object the name Titan? And it turns out, and I, I noticed that Alan Chapman is in the audience, so I'm very wary on any, any matter historical, but I think it was, in fact, our fourth president, John Herschel, who... who gave the name Titan to, uh, 
to, 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 to this object. So as this is the presidential address, I am looking for connections with previous presidents. So that's the first one. Um, moving on a bit, uh, really the next, I, I guess, significant um, development in, in our knowledge and understanding of this object came in the early 20th century with a paper in 1908 from Jose Comas Sola, who was the director of the Barcelona Observatory. And, and I, I love this paper in several respects. One in particular is that we have here a Catalan astronomer, and I am very careful here. I always used to describe him as a Spanish astronomer. You can imagine what happened. I was giving a public talk, and I had a very irate gentleman who, who berated me for calling him Spanish when, obviously, he's Catalan, so Catalan astronomer publishing a paper in Astronomische Nachrichten, a German journal, and writing in French. <laughs> so for me, this, this sort of epitomizes the international nature of science, which, which has, has, you know, has been the case for perhaps as long as we've practiced science. And I just highlight the last paragraph in this paper. The paper is um, observations of the principal satellites of Jupiter and of Titan, and uh, to I, I have O-level French, so I'm allowed to translate. Uh, we we can legitimately suppose that this great obscurity at the edges demonstrates the existence of an of a very absorbing atmosphere around Titan. So he was claiming in the, in this sketch here that that he'd observed limb darkening. Uh, in, in, in his observations uh, of, of Titan. And there's, there's a blow up of that sketch. Just as an aside, these observations have actually been questioned. The veracity of them have, have subsequently been questioned. But let's take this to be the first indication of uh, the existence of an atmosphere. So I, I'd now like to pick out a couple of pre Voyager um, developments in the 20th century that are relevant. And the, the, the first of these is, is Gerard Kuiper, a Dutch astronomer but working in the US, who in the 1940s, using a, a newly developed uh, spectrometer, uh, detected absorption bands due to, to methane, gaseous methane, uh, in his observations of Titan. Those were published. He also suggested that the appearance, the visual appearance of Titan, which it shows an orange, very distinctive orange hue, was perhaps due to, was similar to Mars, was due to the, 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 the oxidized uh, nature of, of the surface of Titan. And then we move on to just before the Voyager encounter, which took place in 1980. So Carl Sagan and his colleagues had been, over several years, been carrying out uh, their versions of the Miller-Urey experiment and had been looking at some of the residues produced in, in, in that experiment. And they characterized them and they made the suggestion that the appearance of Titan was due to the, the production, the photochemical production in the atmosphere of Titan of these, these, these uh, uh, aerosols and the, the long chain molecules which he described which they termed tholins after the Greek term uh, for, for muddy and suggested that this indeed was the reason for the appearance, the visual appearance of Titan. So that was uh, uh, just before the arrival of uh, uh, Voyager at uh, Titan. So the uh, Voyager 1 was in fact redirected for a particularly close flyby of, of, of Titan, 4,000 kilometers or so, and it, it, it produced about 2,000 images of, the, of, of Titan. And in some respects, these were quite disappointing. They all showed essentially a bland uh, orange uh, uh, sphere with very little variation, very little detail, a little bit of uh, uh, hemispherical asymmetry between the north and the south, but despite extensive image processing, there was, there was no sign of any features, certainly uh, below 
the, the, the haze, the atmospheric haze. However, of course, Voyager did a lot more than carry uh, a camera. There were, there were several, many instruments, uh, spectroscopic, uh, radio sounding instruments. And so I'll summarize here the main uh, conclusions, the main discoveries as a result of, of that flyby. So it was confirmed indeed uh, beyond any shadow of a doubt as the only planetary satellite with an atmosphere, a very significant atmosphere, dominated by nitrogen and methane and about a dozen um, uh, hydrocarbons and nitriles, almost certainly the products of photolysis, the photolysis of nitrogen and methane uh, in, in, in the upper atmosphere producing these products. The, the, the flyby was close enough that the deflection could be measured and the deflection of the spacecraft could be measured and that allowed a, a measurement of the bulk density, uh, which is important because it gives you a handle on the broad composition of ice and uh, rocky material and it turned out to be something like 60% icy, 40% uh, rocky material presumably the rocky core and an and, and, and icy crust uh, surrounding it. Uh, the diameter, which had never been tied down because of the fact that the, the surface couldn't be seen, was, was finally tied down by the radio sounder, which could probe uh, through the atmosphere, and it gave uh, a precise determination, which made it just smaller than Ganymede, so the second uh, largest uh, uh, moon in the solar system and significantly larger than Mercury, for example. But also the radio sounder gave a pretty accurate determination of both the pressure and the temperature profiles and down to the surface. And it, it, it showed that the surface pressure was 50% greater than the surface pressure on Earth. The temperature, because of the, the large distance from the sun, was of the order of minus 180 centigrade. And if, if you uh, convert these measurements into uh, um, the mass of the atmosphere, the, the, the column density, so the, the kilograms per square meter, turns out to be about an order of magnitude greater than here on Earth. The, the, it's the low gravity which gives you the relatively low pressure compared with the amount of, of, of atmosphere. So a very, very significant atmosphere. And in the, the, the few years immediately following the uh, encounter, in the early 1980s, people started looking at the atmospheric composition and trying to model the processes and the implications for Titan. And it became clear, and this was work led by Jonathan Lunin, who was then a PhD student, who became a, a very significant player in the Cassini-Huygens project. Uh, he showed that the, the, the lifetime for the existence of methane in the Titan environment was, was relatively short, well, measured on the time scale of millions of years. And, of course, we don't like to think that we're observing at a preferred time, so he suggested that there was a source of methane to replenish what was lost, and the obvious place to put that, of course, is on the surface. We know the pressure and temperature uh, at the surface, and when you do that, you find, I hope it's clear in this artist's impression, that what you have at the surface is, is a sea. In other words, methane at the pressure and temperature uh, that we discovered from Voyager, methane would in fact be in liquid form. So this is the context in which the Cassini-Huygens mission, the proposal, and then the mission evolved so that with the knowledge of this place, a place with a rich atmosphere and possibly an exotic uh, surface. And so this, this is the result of uh, a few years later. I make a few comments about this. First of all, I noticed <coughs> Professor Fred Taylor in the audience, and I think Fred was a very significant player in bringing together the US and the European sides. Any of you who've been involved in trying to make very large projects happen will know how difficult it is. And, and Fred was certainly part of that uh, uh, team that uh, uh, eventually made, made uh, this mission happen. And 
I should also say, since there are at least two Italian nationals in the audience, I must make a correction to this slide. I mean, it looks like this was an ESA-NASA collaboration. In fact, Italy, though part of ESA, also contributed significantly extra to the project. So really, there should be the Italian Space Agency badge there. It's, it's technically a, a tripartite uh, collaboration. And the, the, in a formal sense, the, the NASA contribution was going to be the, the large Cassini orbiting spacecraft. The European uh, contribution was the Huygens uh, lander. And there was, I sh should mention that there was very significant UK involvement from, from the very beginning. So two instruments uh, on board Huygens had uh, significant involvement, and I think six of the 12. Uh, on uh, Cassini. And I should mention the institutions. I probably will forget some. But uh, on Cassini, uh, Queen Mary, Imperial, UCL, Oxford, and Sheffield. On the Huygens Lander, the Open University, Kent, the Rutherford Laboratory, and Southampton. And another connection with previous presidents of the society is that one of the instruments on Cassini was led by Professor David Southwood, who was uh, president a few years ago. And uh, so he, he led the development of that instrument. And then subsequently, that leadership passed over to, to Michelle Doherty, who has presented results. Well, David and Michelle had both presented <laughs> results from the magnetometer at the society previously. So just quickly uh, whizzing through a, a few slides of background. Uh, the, the only way really we can get to the outer solar system with any sensible payload is to use gravity assists. We had four gravity assists on this mission, two at Venus, one at Earth, and one at Jupiter. Launch in October 97 and arrival in 2004. So as, as planetary scientists, we do have to be very patient. Um, it was also about seven years to design and build, seven years to get there. So it was literally 15 years from, uh, from the start to even a, a arrival. Um, so a few words about the Huygens probe. Here again, a little bit of artistic license. You can see Cassini rather low down. Uh, at, at the encounter, it was actually flying overhead at about 60,000 uh, kilometers. You also notice that Saturn, all, you know, despite this, this opaque orange haze, it always appears in the, the uh, artist's impression. But uh, what I like about this is the, is the surface, because it shows really our range of uncertainty at, at the very start of the project in, in, in what we were designing for. And literally, the surface could have been in, in our understanding then, ice, these, these aren't the rice cliffs here, I guess, so it could have been solid ice, could have been uh, uh, lakes or even seas of, of methane, or something in, in between. The, the, the result of the photochemistry, we, we, we believed, would be a rain of, of, of material, of aerosols, of gooey tholins, so it could have been a gunge on, on the surface that we landed in. And because of this uncertainty, the, the, the probe was always designed as an atmospheric probe. Since, since uh, survival on landing could never be guaranteed, the focus had always been on taking measurements during the atmospheric descent, and surface uh, measurements were always to be a bonus. Well, what happened, um, it's, it's a, a long and a wonderful story, I would say, but... Uh, to, to uh, cut it short, or to, to paraphrase, the probe was released on Christmas Day 2004 on a collision course uh, with Titan, it coasted for 22 days, hit the top of the atmosphere at about seven kilometers a second, and then aerodynamic drag slowed the probe down uh, to the point at which parachutes could be used, and then a series of three parachutes to take us to the surface. That took two and a half hours. And to our amazement, we survived the landing, relatively unscathed, in fact. The design figure that we worked for, for the instruments, for uh, planning, for, for making measurements on the surface, was three minutes, a maximum of three minutes. 
and we got 72 minutes on the surface. In fact, the, the, we, we lost uh, communication with the probe simply because of the geometry. Cassini was <coughs> passing overhead and literally passed over the horizon. And there's reason to believe that, in fact, the batteries would have lasted for another 20 minutes or so before the probe was completely dead. So um, I'm going to talk uh, just a little bit about the results from Huygens, but mostly what has been achieved uh, with uh, Cassini. Uh, but just a few uh, slides from um, uh, what, what was, was measured from Huygens. Now, um, I, I prefer using raw images there. If you look, you can find very beautiful, cleaned-up images. But these, these are some of the original images as we descended through the clouds at about 40 kilometers. We came through the, the, the haze and the cloud and started to see the surface. And this is from about 8 uh, kilometers in altitude. And as you can see, the probe was, was spinning and also being slightly buffeted by the wind. So this is uh, distinct uh, images which have been stitched together to produce this uh, uh, landscape. And you get an idea of the scale there, two and a half kilometers. And, and the first thing that I think strikes one are these features which appear to show, well, certainly drainage channels in, 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 in this case here, what would look very familiar on Earth. They look like uh, rivers and tributaries. This one is, is slightly different. It's, it's far straighter and more angular uh, and maybe is, is more to do with some sort of uh, uh, faulting or, or geological process uh, on, on the surface of Titan. Um, so this is the environment we were, uh, that we, we landed in and, and discovered. Uh, I would just point out that the total uh, sort of vista, the total area that, that Huygens essentially uh, delivered information on was about 100 square kilometers. So really a very small part of Huygens, which has, of, of Titan, which has 80 million square kilometers of surface. So it was, you know, relatively, relatively high resolution and, and accurate uh, information, but on a very limited uh, part of the surface. And this, this is the, the landing image. Again, this is the raw image uh, before it was cleaned up. But uh, uh, I, I love to see it because it's the one that we first saw, uh, this, um, this undulating uh, region with what looked like pebbles or cobbles, r remarkably smooth and rounded. And uh, I don't know if you can see here but certainly there's indication of the material underneath some of these pebbles having been washed away. So all sorts of indication that liquid uh, uh, has, has flowed on the surface. In, in, in fact, the, the, we have 117 copies of this image. Um, the, 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 the camera was static and, and they had little faith of survival on the, on the surface. So there was not even any simple articulation to give uh, uh, any panorama, but uh, even that is a, is a wonderful uh, image. Uh, so the, the camera, which was a lot more than a camera, it was a spectrometer, a, a polarimeter, and also had three different viewing directions, so it was a, a complex instrument. The other, I'd say, largest instrument was the mass spectrometer, GCMS. Uh, this is just a, a, a couple of, of, of graphs from that image, so one, one measurement at altitude and one on the surface. Um, I'll just point out a couple of things. One is the strong signal of argon-40. So argon-40 is only produced by the radioactive decay of potassium-40 and on the Earth occurs uh, in, 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 in the crust from the decay of, of, um, of uh, radioactive uh, uh, rocks. So this we're presumably seeing a similar uh, feature on, on, on Titan. Uh, the decay of, of, of material in, in the rocky core and the gas then percolating to the surface. And, and it was also apparent that the, the surface was chemically that very rich. You can see here uh, that far more uh, species detected in the same uh, uh, measurement time there. And, and this, this implies 
that the surface in, is in fact soaked by the products of, 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 material, of photochemistry in the atmosphere, which is raining down over, over millennia and is soaking the surface in, in the products of, of that chemistry. Uh, my instrument was the surface science package. I should just mention the main hardware collaborators were the Rutherford Lab and uh, the Open University. And because of the uncertainty of what we were going to land on or in, um, we used a variety of, of sensors, nine different sensors, several of them optimized, in fact, for a liquid landing. And they all worked, and they all contributed to, to, to really describing the physical nature, physical and chemical nature, of the surface at the landing site. I, we also provided part of an instrument for the Italian-led uh, HASI, uh, Huygens Atmospheric Structure Instrument. I just say a few words about this because, to, to me, it, 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 it epitomizes the diff one of the many different ways in which we do astronomy and geophysics. You know, uh, there, there are some of us who sit on mountaintops using incredibly exquisite uh, large telescopes. Some sit on mountaintops uh, looking at volcanoes. Others go deep into mines uh, to look at neutrinos. Others need a, just a pencil and paper. Others, supercomputers. And one way that we do planetary science is that we take an accelerometer, in principle a very simple device, and we had to repackage this device to survive for seven and a half years. But we use it uh, through, but if you think about it, the, the, the drag uh, on, the, uh, on the, uh, an aerodynamic uh, shape entering uh, a planetary atmosphere, then the deceleration is related to the, the density of the atmosphere through factors which you should know. So in principle, by measuring the deceleration of a probe, uh, you can measure very sensitively the upper reaches of an atmosphere that you really can't get at through any other technique. And that's been done at Mars, for example. It's really the only way to get the uh, very top of the atmosphere, the, the, the density profile. And it, it, remarked, it worked remarkably well, even better than, than we expected. We're not quite sure why it worked so well. So this is over th the three-minute uh, high-speed entry of the probe. Here is the point where the parachutes are deployed, and then you can convert that into a density profile. And in fact, it started to give a signal at 1,400 kilometers above the surface. Uh, this is at the sub-micro-G level. It's about a uh, sensitivity is about 0.3 micro-Gs. And this, this was a surprise at first. But in fact, what we were seeing, the, the probe was spinning for stability, and there was a very slight wobble, a, a, a mutation on it. And that's what we were seeing. And then as it hit more substantial atmosphere, you can see the signal taking off. And uh, the, so this, the, the, the red curve here is the derived uh, density profile. You can see from, in fact, 1,400 kilometers down to uh, 200 kilometers or so when the parachutes uh, started to uh, operate. And the, 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 the gray lines here are the engineering model of the atmospheric density to which the probe was designed. And being a logarithmic scale, you see you have a factor uncertainty of a factor of a thousand. So this was tied that down very well. Um, I'm going to jump ahead because of the time. Um, so, uh, so, just an uh, overview of where we stand now. As I've said, we've had 127 uh, flybys, and this has now set Cassini onto its, its what is called the grand finale. Uh, so, 22 uh, uh, weekly orbits, which are taking it between the inner rings and the upper atmosphere, and there'll be a distant flyby of Titan in September, the, the PR people at ESA and NASA are calling that the goodbye kiss because that will push Cassini onto its collision course with Saturn and it will burn up in the atmosphere four days later on the 15th. So we've had 127 
flybys, which give us very roughly, to try and quantify this, each flyby is a bit over a day in terms of observation time at Titan. So we've had about 160 days' worth of data from Cassini versus three hours uh, from Huygens. But as I've said, of course, Huygens looked at a very narrow uh, region of Titan compared with essentially near-global coverage from Cassini from these 100-plus flybys. So I'm going to show... Uh, just a, a few of, of the results in the remaining time from Cassini. This is in no way a, 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 a complete review. It's a very biased. I'm showing the results that, that have interested me most. We are here then on these uh, orange final uh, um, orbits. Uh, and this, this, what you can see here is, I think, the last year or so, this, this incredibly complex tour which has taken place, which, of course, Titan is only one of the targets of Cassini-Huygens. There's, there's, there's Saturn, the rings, the magnetosphere, and several of the other satellites. So, let's cut to the chase. To the artist's impression, you remember, the sea or the, 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 the lake on Titan? Well, it, it, it's true. There are indeed very significant bodies of liquid on Titan. So this is looking at the North Pole, and this is a summation of many observations from the one radar instrument on board. Remember, we, we have this apparently opaque haze, though there are windows in, in, in the haze in the red uh, part of the spectrum and in the near-infrared. I'll say a bit about that in a minute. But it's the radar instrument which has really given, I would say, the, the, the best sort of global picture of, of the surface. And so this is a composite of many uh, passes. You can see each, each pass, pass gives you a strip uh, across the surface. And uh, so this is a summation of those put together a year or so ago. There are many, there are many modes of, of operation of the radar. You can see here the different resolutions achievable, you know, compared with images that we might be used to from, from, from Mars, for example. Th th these are quite crude in some senses in terms of their resolution. So it's typically kilometers or even tens of kilometers. But still, we, we're beginning to get, I think, a, a moderately good overview. And we see these large bodies of, of, of liquid, Ligeia Mare and Kraken Mare. So this one, the largest, is about 400,000 square kilometers. And we're looking here from the North Pole down to about uh, fifth, I think that's 50 degrees uh, latitude. Here, for example, is a comparison of, uh, of Ligeia Mare, the second largest, with Lake Superior, the largest of the Great Lakes. So this gives you an idea of the scale. We're dealing with, with very significant bodies uh, of liquid. Now, we've had, what, eight or more years of observation, so it's, it's, we're now at the point where we can see uh, possible uh, changes, po possible variations in, in structures, and interestingly, some of the lakes some of the seas, seem to show a remarkably unchanging coastline, for example. But others show distinct variations. And this is one that, that uh, to me, stands out. So between, in fact, uh, May 2013 and August 2014, this feature appeared here. To give you an idea of scale, that's, that's about 100 square kilometres. So something appeared for a few months and then essentially disappeared. And it, it, I suppose the obvious interpretation is that there is a, a level change in the, in the sea and that, that an island has been exposed. But in fact, the, for, for, for various circumstantial reasons, it appears that this is more likely to be some sort of upwelling of, of material from below the surface or even surface disturbance. But a, a significant change there on a time scale of several months. There are also uh, these, these rather ghostly uh, appearances here. You can see that generally, remember this is a radar false uh, color image, uh, 
the, the, the most of the, the lakes appear. So, but there are these uh, images, which are presumably lakes which are either evaporating and, and, and disappearing, or conversely, are, are, are filling up as, as precipitation or some other source uh, fills them with liquid. Um, I don't like this title. This is from the Nasserisa press release. But it's, it's the, the, the most extensive river that, that's been seen. So this is feeding that, uh, the, the, that second uh, largest sea. And this is, this is about 400 kilometers long. So very significant uh, channel uh, leading in to, uh, to that sea. Now, I've, I've glibly assumed that, that we are dealing with uh, liquid, that these, these much darker areas are, in fact, lakes or seas. There, there is some uh, uh, indirect evidence for this, but this, to me, is, is, is the most compelling. It's a, it's a very simple observation, and this is a completely fortuitous one. This is from the, uh, the, the, the VIMS instrument at about five microns in the near infrared. And this was looking back at Titan after one of the flybys. And this extremely bright spot appeared. It saturated uh, the, the, the detector. And it, it, in fact, is at the edge of, the, uh, of Kraken Maris, so or one of the seas. And really, the only sensible interpretation is that this is sun glint. The geometry is absolutely right. So this is the sun shining off uh, an extremely flat uh, surface, which uh, can surely only be uh, a, a sea or a lake. Um, a few other, uh, to me, extremely interesting measurements. So the radar can work in, as I said, several modes. One of them is in the active mode, where a, a, a a, a signal is, is bounced off the surface uh, as, as opposed to a passive radiometry. And so this is an example of a, a, a transverse cut, a transect, 300 kilometers uh, across the Ligaea Mare. And here is a, a, a graph showing the return, the radar return here, and the, the color indicates the strength of that return. And if you look here, you can see a second return, uh, just delayed by a, 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 a fraction of, of, of time. And the obvious, in, well, really the, the only interpretation is that we're seeing the reflection off the surface of the sea there, a relatively strong return. And then a second return from the, from the signal that, that um, goes into the surface and reflects from the bottom of the sea. And this then is a plot of the depth uh, across the sea there. So I find it absolutely remarkable that not only have we gone to this strange place in the outer solar system, we've been able to see uh, the, 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 the previously unseen surface, but we are even able to perform bathymetry. We're able to measure and map at least crudely, the, the bottom of a sea on this other body. And uh, another um, example of, of active sounding. So this is now across. This is where that 400-kilometer uh, river feeds into the sea. Here's a cut across there, crossing that uh, river and several other uh, tributaries marked there. And so this is the, the radar signal. Again, you see an, an extremely flat surface. Incidentally, you can even um, put an upper limit on the waves, on the height of the waves on the surface of this lake. And that's, it's, it's at the centimeter level. This, this is flat, at least at the time of these observations, to, to centimeters. Um, but here you can see the, the, the signals uh, from this rougher terrain, and here the, the, the canyons uh, which we cross there and there. And these you can convert again to a 
a, a topographic uh, map along this cut. And what, what is striking is how relatively narrow but steep these canyons are. There's a sort of 40 degree angle on, on the canyon walls. So the suggestion is that these are probably produced by episodic, relatively violent falls of, of methane, of rain, uh, producing uh, the, this, this kind of shape as, as occurs on Earth. So just a few other um, features that um, I'd like to show you. Something we see very little of are impact craters. So they're, they're literally only a handful that have been seen uh, in images to date. Not surprised. Well, uh, the thick atmosphere, of course, fil essentially acts as a filter against um, uh, incoming meteoroids of, of a certain size. But you would expect to see far more if the of, of a large uh, size if, if the surface were um, uh, inactive, you know, like a surface of, of the moon or Mercury. Uh, but this is another piece of evidence that, in fact, that the, the, the surface is active, that there is weathering and, and, and uh, forces which resurface uh, the, the surface of Titan. Also, a relatively common uh, feature is, as shown here on the left-hand side, uh, periodic uh, structures the spacing of typically a kilometer or so, and the, the, the analogy here, these, these are images of, in fact, radar images from, from, from the Earth showing dune-like structures. So the, the, the belief is that we're dealing with, I think dunes is, is the best word, features which are produced by the motion of wind flowing over granular uh, material. And this is an image which puts together s um, uh, several of these features that I've shown in their correct locations. I think the only one that I haven't mentioned is this one here. Uh, the, the, a few observations which suggest that, that cryovolcanoes might, might have been uh, seen on the surface. They're, they're, you know, the resolution is... is is relatively poor, so it's, it's, it's difficult to be certain. But this shows you the range of, of surface, uh, the, 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 the range of the, the nature of the surface that has been seen so far, even with this relatively, uh, by the standards of the terrestrial planets, relatively poor resolution. I've said very little about the atmosphere. Let me just show very quickly, because of the time, a few slides. So this is uh, some cloud structure there over a, a pass of a few hours showing sign of evolution. So, so weather, there, there, there are uh, weather systems. Um, sunlight, of course, is, is very weak, only about 1% of the intensity here at Earth, but um, it it's, appears to be sufficient to drive weather here again in... in a, a different uh, pass showing uh, clouds which are appearing to, uh, to be moving, evolving. So, so uh, and here, this is going back to Huygens data, the structure of the atmosphere from the instrument I, I showed and measurement of pressure during the descent. So really a remarkably Earth-like structure in terms of the gross um, structure of the atmosphere. Uh, I've said very little bit about the chemistry uh, in the atmosphere. There have been several, several close passes which have flown through uh, the, 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 uh, the upper atmosphere and the in situ uh, instruments have measured some of the uh, chemistry, some of the products that are, are, are occurring there. And it, it certainly seems to support the idea that it is photolysis uh, driven by its UV and energetic particles from Saturn, which break down the nitrogen and methane to produce this uh, increasingly complex chemistry. 
uh, which then produces products raining down on the surface. So here's a little cartoon showing that in fact we almost certainly have a cycle which is comparable to the water cycle on Earth with, with methane, um, with a much uh, lower uh, solar radiation to drive it, of course, but still, on, on, in, in gross terms, quite similar to what we see uh, here on Earth. What I would say is that the methane, which needs to be replenished, and this was the original reason for the suggestion of liquid on the surface, it seems that the, the, the methane uh, inventory that, that, that we see is not sufficient to, to explain uh, the, the, the long-lived nature of, of methane. So there might, this is one reason to support the idea of the evolution of methane uh, from, from reservoirs below the surface, maybe in the form of, of cryovolcanoes. Okay, um, I'm very conscious of the time. I will just mention that there is tantalizing evidence of a, even a global subsurface ocean. I would say the evidence is, is, is moderately strong, but uh, that, that will wait for uh, future missions. There's a, 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 a tremendous review paper just come out in, in, in the last few months from uh, Sarah Horst, and... Uh, well, she's highlighted a whole bunch of, of open questions. As always, when we go somewhere new, uh, we almost always scratch the surface and, and raise more questions. I uh, highlight some of them. Um, I would just mention, for example, the atmosphere. The, 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 the origin of the atmosphere is still uh, un unclear. I, I would say that the consensus is now that this is not a primitive uh, original atmosphere, um, the, the origin of Titan's methane. What I would, uh, I, I'm particularly attracted by these, the composition of the lakes and seas, the surface, but also the circulation in the lakes and seas and, and how is it driven by atmospheric dynamics. We, if we had indeed landed in one of those lakes, um, our instruments would have measured, in fact, the, the, the wave motion. Uh, on the surface of Titan that awaits for the next, uh, next mission. So my last few slides, so really now we're moving towards great artistic license. Um, this was in a proposal that went to ESA. It was led by Athena Kustenis from, from Paris. So this was a mission uh, to go to, to Titan, and it involved three elements, an, an, an orbiter, an aerial platform. Titan is near ideal place for, for, for a Montgolfier or an aerial platform. It has a dense atmosphere. It has low gravity. There are some technical difficulties, you know, power and, and, and things like that, and extremely low temperature. But it would take about two weeks to do a complete circuit at, at the equator. And when you found particularly interesting places, you could then <coughs> deposit a lander to make uh, detailed measurements at those interesting places. So despite this picture, that, that proposal did quite well, um, <laughs> though it, it, it lost out to, uh, to, to what, what has become JUICE, uh, the, the, the Jupiter mission. But, but its time will come. And uh, th this is another one. This actually, this is my favorite. So this was a pro proposal that went to NASA about five years ago in response to a discovery mission call. Now that we know the size of the seas, um, we can confidently say that we can put a probe down and land it in, in one, of, one of the seas. So this was a proposal from, led by Ellen Stofan, who was chief scientist at NASA until recently. And I have to say, to my amazement, it got down to the last three in that particular competition. I, I thought that it was very ambitious. It lost out to InSight, the Mars mission, which, which launches next year. But I very much hope that uh, certainly in my lifetime we'll have an address at this society from a mission uh, like this one or as in the last uh, slide. So my last two slides... Um, as somebody who has an interest in technology, um, it, it's, it, you know, the technology of these long 
standing missions is fascinating. We've seen it with Voyager, of course, which is still giving us some data. Um, with the technology, for example, of this mission, I thought about how things have changed. And I had, although I think I've lost it, I had a little memory stick, which I'm sure we've all got these memory sticks, which just cost a few pounds. And my memory stick, which has a capacity of two gigabytes, is exactly the same as the memory on Cassini. So it, it, it's staggering, isn't it, that, that uh, sophisticated mission like that, its, its entire memory is, is two gigabits, of which the data, so a flyby of Titan, for example, the entire data set has to fit into less than that, in fact, because of the engineering data and the commands and so on. And another thing, uh, the, the imaging system, the, the focal plane detector, has one, mega, uh, one megapixels, one million pixels, you know, which is a fraction of what you all have on, on your, your phones, of course. Um, and in fact, the Huygens camera had a, was, was, was much smaller than that. Um, also, uh, of course, many people here work on large projects involving many people, and a project like this is an extreme example of an enormous number of people working from all over the world, from uh, academia, industry, agencies, and so on. And for me, one of the great pleasures has been to work in that environment. I know people are not always a pleasure, uh, as we all know, when we have to try and work together. But it is remarkable, I think, when people can work together on a common cause uh, such as, as this. But of course, when you work on these very long missions, um, inevitably, the people who you start with don't always make it to the end. And so I just mentioned from my own personal experience, four people who I work very closely with who have sadly uh, you know, died uh, before the end. So this is John Geek. Some of you might know some of these people from Manchester who designed the refractometer on our instruments, which worked very nicely, though sadly it didn't land in liquid when it would have told us the composition. Hasso Neiman, who was the PI from the Goddard Space Flight Center of the mass spectrometer, and I showed one of the, the spectra. Uh, he uh, died uh, a year or two ago, so he saw the fruits of his labor. Uh, this is Hamid Hassan. If anybody of you worked on Hipparchos, he was the ESA project scientist on Hipparchos, and uh, then he moved to Huygens. He's the hardest person I've ever worked for. And he almost had us in tears on many occasions. But you do need people like that to, to bring these incredibly complex and uh, difficult projects to fruition. He saw the successful launch, but sadly didn't see the landing. And then one of the three people who really uh, were responsible for bringing Europe and the USA together, this is Toby Owen, who some people will know, and Fred knew him very well, from the University of Hawaii. He died just uh, a couple of months ago. So that is a sad but inevitable, I guess. And finally, then, I'll leave you with this, this bland uh, image of Titan. Uh, and uh, I, I think we're all, uh, I'm convinced that b below that bland surface, there's a fascinating place. And I look forward to a future, well, if not a presidential address, an address uh, which will tell us about where going on in the